Good evening and welcome to my yard. I've decided I'm going to be a little bit laid back. I got my sermon finished a little bit early, th early this week and I've got a busy weekend ahead, but it's going to be restful and relaxing. But I wanted to go ahead and get things taped, so I'm sitting relaxed in my backyard with uh, my favorite windbreaker jacket. It's a cool fall evening, and you can hear the crickets cheep, chirping, and some uh, every once in a while the geese fly over, and it's just a fun evening. And I welcome you to my yard, my church, and God's presence and His Word. And I hope that you will take his words to heart and uh, be restored by what I have to say uh, from his leading and his insight. Let's open with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for who you are. As always, we just pray that you will open our minds and hearts to your word as we begin to look at the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God as you would have us to live on earth as it is in heaven. We thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for your healing strength and for your daily encouragements. Um, help us to be the witness of your love. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, I am going to start a ser series on the kingdom of God. And uh, I found it to be a very, very interesting subject. I'm, I, I love to prepare sermons because the one person they speak to, if none other, is myself. But anyway, I'm going to maybe repeat a sermon illustration I've already shared with you. If so, I'm sorry. I'm old. I can't remember. Anyway, I am a dreamer. I always have been. When I was small, I dreamed of being a princess. No lie, I was there. But of course, I matured out of that phase somewhat. <laughs> I began to dream of seeing the world I had found in books. I loved looking through encyclopedias and the National Geographic atlases enthralled me. They still do. I remember the year they opened Walt Disney World in Florida. The year was 1971 and I was eight. They released a coloring book about the theme park and I got one with a new box of crayons for Christmas that year. And in that package was also a coloring book of the national parks, Yellowstone, the Grand Canyon, Yosemite. I never colored a page because I had not seen the views and the vistas in living color and I didn't know where to start. Oh, how I longed to see the world. And then came Keith, my mister. I know why the bear went over the mountain, because I married the bear, and the song is correct. He simply wants to see what he can see. And we did, and we still do. The greatest part of our adventures is in the planning, the dreaming and the anticipation. My experience has my experience has always far exceeded my expectations. I have yet to be underwhelmed. The world, God's creation, both human and physical, is a beautiful place and it is truly good. Yes, I've seen horrible things, experienced horrible things, and if truth be told, done some pretty horrible things. But God and His world is still good. One thing I've learned in hindsight, no matter how many travel books read or maps investigated, my expectations were very inadequate compared to the reality I found at my destination. And two, pictures never do anything justice, which is my segue into today's sermon topic, the kingdom of God and what our expectations should be. The New Testament writers were keenly aware of the rich history of God's faithfulness to Israel. Like all Jewish boys, they learned their, at their father's knee the promises they would inherit as told by the prophets. They now believed Jesus was the fulfillment of that promise and the Old Covenant fulfillment would, be, uh, would establish the New Covenant through Jesus. In this they were not wrong but they were attempting to communicate a reality that was too large to comprehend, a Jesus who is the living story of the one true God who is love. Through Jesus, God revealed his purposes, his steadfast love, his salvation, and his righteous judgment. Israel was reminded of their covenant responsibilities, but also what God would expect to the future. Israel expected something totally different in God's kingship over all the earth other than what God had planned from the very beginning of humanity. Jesus would confirm the truth. All nations will know the true God and will join Israel in worshiping him. Zechariah 2, 10 and 11 says, 
Shout and be glad, O daughter of Zion, for I am coming and I will live among you, declares the Lord. Many nations will be joined with the Lord in the day and will become my people. I will live among you and you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. It is no shocker that even though the prophets had the same message, they had diverse ideas. My puppy dog has come to say hello. They had diverse ideas regarding the shape of the coming kingdom. And like my pictures of the Scottish Highlands, their descriptions just don't do the reality justice. The kingdom that came was not one of universal political power, but of universal grace. We speak often of the kingdom being in us through the work of the Holy Spirit, but we live in an incomplete expectation if we don't also speak and act of our being in the kingdom presently. The diverse perception of God's kingdom was a gateway to controversy among the hearers. There is a kingdom of darkness that tries to obstruct the coming kingdom of God. And even if people of Jesus' time and today miss Jesus' identity, the kingdom of darkness absolutely did not. We saw this when the demon spoke to Jesus. And we have that reference in Mark chapter 9, verses 14 through 29. Satan unleashed every weapon in his arsenal, but know this, the decisive defeat of Satan and all of the powers allied with him is part of God's redemptive activity. The inaugural act began with Jesus' coming and was completed when the last enemy is destroyed or will be completed when the last enemy is destroyed and that enemy is death. However, there are still many dimensions to the kingdom we don't understand, yet those whose hope is in the kingdom know that it must be the controlling and defining center of our existence. So I want to go to the Gospels, to Jesus' own life story. All three synoptic or the synopsis Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, tell the story of Jesus and the children followed uh, tell the story of Jesus and the children followed by an encounter with a rich young ruler Almost word for word identically There is much to be seen of the kingdom of God in these two vignettes From Mark chapter 10 verses 13 through 16 it says People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them But the disciples rebuked them when Jesus saw this he was indignant he said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And then he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. Jesus' entrance and presence turned the world's value system upside down. The kingdom of God will be composed of nobodies. There will be no pompous people in heaven strutting around the universe as if they own the place. In Jesus' lifetime, it was an insult to compare an adult to a child. So it's hard to imagine a more offensive way to describe kingdom inhabitants. Talk about a decline in the property values. Well, however, children and those who are willing to become childlike will fill the rooms of that mansion in the kingdom. Let's take a closer look at the attributes of children. Small children are totally dependent and considered expendable at the time Jesus walked the earth. They were not even as valued as a cash crop or the family cow. Neither were they socially welcomed. They had no rights to anything. They were, completely comp a, they were a completely compromised population aside from the goodness of their attending adults. One, on the upside though, children typically live with no regrets and are free from mental pride. They have not reached that stage of their maturity. While terribly unsophisticated, they are trustful, teachable, loving, and kind. And Jesus said, except you become as little children, you surely know wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. That's from Matthew chapter 18 verses 3 and it is the King James Version. Adding to this desired simplicity of childlikeness will be throngs of those who mourn, the meek, the hungry and thirsty, the merciful, pure in heart, peacemakers, and the persecuted. In other words, the prostitutes, adulterers, beggars, tax collectors, prodigals, Samaritans, shepherds, persecutors, and demoniacs who were transformed when Jesus touched them. In the opinion of the church leaders, 
Jesus' association with people disqualified him from temple worship, and certainly as the one sent from God. We've talked about what the kingdom looks like, but how do you get there? Are there any loopholes? Is it really that rigid? Where does the love part unfold? Well, just after Jesus blesses the children, a rich young ruler comes to see him. And this story is found in Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 through 20, Mark 10, 17 through 31, Luke 18, 18 through 30. Take your pick. They're all almost exactly the same. Now a man came up to Jesus and asked, <clears throat> Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, obey the commandments. Which ones? The man inquired. Jesus replied, Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. All of these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Jesus answered, If you want to be perfect, go. Sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad, because he had great wealth. First of all, this story was never about the amount of sharing you do from your bank account. Zacchaeus offered to give half of his wealth, and salvation was bestowed on him. That's in Luke chapter 19.9. The kingdom kin kinship begins when one humbly repents of his or her sins and is radically transformed by the kingdom's values. These terms are uniform. They do not change. Jesus does not make side deals. But that is exactly what the rich young ruler came looking for. Jesus' response to the question, what must I do, was the exact response every Jewish man would have made. It was basic Jewish theology. You keep God's law. The end. Still, this rich, young ruler, this rich young ruler felt there was something more, something of great substance, yet he was neither poor in spirit or material comforts. He was looking for a deal. This Jesus is a pretty good option for networking and social standing. I think I'd like him on my team. He wasn't looking to relinquish his rights to self-autonomy or self-governance. He was seeking to add Jesus to his friend group, not instead of anything, but in addition to. His keeping of the commandments was not from the heart, but a transactional reflex, and we see in the next few verses the disciples still struggled with this fundamental perception of holiness. They believed riches were the residual blessing of goodness, the gauge of one's spiritual state. So this Jesus, knowing their struggle, addressed their questions in the moment. Matthew 19, 23 through 30 says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth, it is hard for the rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easy for, easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Peter answered him, we have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. At the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel, and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mother or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. Many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. No one will enter the kingdom for whom the kingdom is just a marginal interest. Nor does God leave it up to any individual or group to decide what the kingdom will mean. That has already been determined by the God whose kingdom it is. Those who recognize their abject spiritual poverty are those who have despaired of all counter kingdoms, the ones they have created and the ones they have participated in. Jesus' purpose was to alleviate pain and sorrow of sin, not to empower arbitrary or impersonal will. Faith is an act of your free choice. And while faith is a gift and fruit of the Holy Spirit, it is still your own faith. 
Jesus affirms the reward, the blessing for the sacrifice of following him. It is not about earnings, equality, or fairness, but rather the generosity of the creator of all things, and he thinks you're worth dying for. Back to the greatest part of adventuring, being the planning, the dreaming, and the anticipation. Go ahead. Imagine heaven and all those who are living there with no pain and disease or sorrow. You won't be able to do it justice, but that's the beauty of hope. Expect it to be just as amazing as grace, because it will be. It is. So don't miss it for the world. I invite you to salvation. Your Heavenly Father is doing everything He can to show you how much He loves you. Open your mind and your heart. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful message. I am sorry every time I hear the story of the rich young ruler. I, I'm sad for his soul that you gave us a free will. Help us to realize our bankruptcy in the things of this world and our wealth in the things that you have created for us and that we have that inheritance through the blood of Jesus. Um, I just pray for the lost. I pray that you will reach out and touch their hearts and convict their souls. Help us as a church to know where to guide our energies toward these people to show them how much you love them. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And now, the Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. You are loved.